Hi again. So I said at the beginning of this series that I was giving another lecture on perception because there was a big difference between the way we study perception in a laboratory with stationary observers typically and the way perception evolved to unfold in the real world. So what I'm going to do now is talk about, well, if movement makes a difference, let's see what it is. Um, movement helps us to perceive things quicker and more accurately. It's much easier to see a moving animal than it is a stationary animal. And when you move around something else, as you move, it changes your viewpoint of the, the thing that you're moving around. Um, so it helps you perceive it more accurately. Turns out your motor system is experience dependent too. Um, and we know this um, from brain imaging studies that looked at brain activity in novice violinists and professional violinists uh, as they imagined playing a piece of music. So if you have uh, both groups of people in a magnet, in an fMRI, and you imagine them playing a piece of Mozart, and then you record their brain activity as they're doing it, what you find is that novices actually use more of their brain. The brain activity is more diffuse. Experts have fine-tuned their movements so they know exactly what activity to focus in on. So experts have brains where the activity is very focal. It's very strong in particular areas. Novices have brains or motor systems and supplementary motor areas where the activity is more diffuse as they're imagining doing the same thing. So training lots of expertise in a particular motor activity like playing the violin changes the way that your brain processes movement. But does motor activity change the way you visually perceive things? Yep. Now, you probably have heard of hand dominance, right? People say all the time, I'm right-handed, I'm left-handed, I'm ambidextrous. So you have a dominant hand. Do you know you have a dominant eye too? You do. Not always, but usually it's the dominant eye is the same is on the same side as your dominant hand. Not always. But how can you, what does that mean, a dominant eye? Well, here's a demonstration that I need you to do to get it. Because if you look at pictures, it's never going to work. You guys got to actually do it. So it's very simple. Find some point. Um, it could be a, a key on your keyboard, or maybe let me do it with the camera here on, on, on my uh, computer. So what I'm doing is I've got my two hands and I've made a hole between my two hands and I've placed them over the camera and both my eyes are open and I've centered the camera so it's right between um, my hands. Now what I'm going to do is close one eye and think about the similarity between what I see, where the camera is, when um, I've got both eyes open versus when I have one eye open. So if I close my left eye, there's very little difference between what I see with two eyes and what I see with just my right eye. Okay? It turns out I'm right eye dominant. So when you're right eye dominant, what you see with two eyes is pretty much the same as what you see with the one eye. But let me do the opposite. Let me close my right eye, so my dominant eye, and look at what happens to that visual image. Actually, that doesn't work. I need something farther away. <laughs> when I close my right eye, the object that I could see before in the hole in my hand, so that I could see very clearly, it shifts completely out of the hole. Right? So my perception is driven largely by what is in my right eye. So I am right eye dominant. So do this test with yourselves. It'll be cool. Let me know what you find. Okay. I have taught you that there, there's a motor cortex over here. I haven't talked about the supplemental areas, but there's a motor cortex here. And then you got this visual cortex back here. Like they're two separate, totally independent systems. Well, they are and they aren't. Uh, there's a lot of cases in which the motor system and the visual system
can really only be understood as one system that works together. So that makes sense because as you move through the environment, what you see changes. So your motor system and your visual system have to work together. And they do from the moment you are born. How do we do that? How do we know that? Um, well, it turns out that if you take a brand new baby, and I'm talking about 15 minutes old, right? And you look at that baby and you make an exaggerated facial gesture like the woman's doing in the slide here. Maybe an open mouth, maybe a big smile, maybe a big pout, maybe you're sticking your tongue out. Not every time, but more often than chance, the baby is going to copy the facial, the, the face that you've just made. So if you do this to a baby, the baby's going to try to do that too. I mean, it's crazy, right? Babies don't know that they have lips. They don't know that they have a tongue. They're not doing this intentionally. Their motor system is copying what they see. So this tight coupling from the moment you're born between what your motor system does and what your visual system does. They work together. This is work from uh, Meltzoff up at University of Washington. Really cool work. Okay, but how about with adults? How do we know that the motor system and the visual system work together in adults? Well, if you do a study in which you ask people to estimate the steepness of a hill by uh, rotating a, a, a little board so that it copies the steepness of a hill, because verbal ratings of slope are terrible. Um, uh, we think everything is just ridiculously uh, steep. Um, but if you ask the motor system to tell you how steep a hill is that you're seeing, you get very different answers depending on some interesting things. If you ask somebody who's just run 10 miles how steep a, a hill slope is with this measure, a tired runner will tell you that the slope is steeper. If you ask an old person how steep the slope of a hill is with this measure, they will tell you that the hill is steeper than a young person. If you take a young person and you weigh them down with a heavy backpack and you ask them to estimate the slope of the hill, they will say if they're weighted down that the hill is steeper than it appeared when they weren't weighted down. Depressed people will tell you hillsides are steeper, the slopes are steeper um, than non-depressed people. Why? Well, because the visual information that you take in has a purpose, and the purpose is to plan your future actions. So if you're really tired and you're looking at a hill, you don't have a lot of energy to go up that hill. So what your visual system is telling you is not the objective truth about the slope of the hill, what your visual system is telling you is, what's it gonna take for you to get up that hill? Oh, forget it, that sucker's too steep, right? If you're feeling good and fine, no problem getting up the hill. If you're exhausted, oi, what a hill slope. Wild, huh? Okay, last thing I wanna tell you about. I had mentioned before this idea that there are highways um, in your brain. Um, we're in California, so you could think of the two highways that I'm going to talk about as the I-5 and the 101. Those are the two highways that connect Northern California and Southern California. When one of those highways uh, is dysfunctional, it can't work, it's chaos in California. I mean, all this traffic goes to the other highway. So knowing about those two highways is very important um, for getting around in California. Understanding these two highways in the human brain is very important for figuring out how neural processes occur. So these two pathways that I told you about before, the dorsal and the ventral pathways, based on um, work from the 80s um, out of NIH by Ungerleiter and Mishkin, um, the idea was that the ventral pathway, the one that runs down along your uh, temporal lobe, that the job of that pathway was to figure out what you're looking at, what an object is, and the pathway that goes up towards your parietal lobe, the job of that is to figure out where objects are. Um, and they concluded that based on research with um, monkeys who had had damage done to one pathway or the other, and they looked at what these monkeys could or couldn't do. 
Um, but what about humans? Well, some Canadian researchers, Milner and Goodale, um, uh, looked into that and, and thought hard about that model of does one freeway, is that responsible for figuring out what objects are and is the other freeway figuring out, de dedicated to figuring out where things are? And they found a patient, a 34-year-old woman who we know as patient DF, um, who had carbon monoxide poisoning. And that carbon monoxide poisoning damaged her what pathway? this temporal lobe or ventral pathway. And as a result of that damage, right, we said, well, if this is the, I keep showing my jaw, I'm sorry. If the temporal lobe pathway is responsible for identifying what an object is, then if a human being has damage to that pathway, they should not be able to recognize what objects are. They should fail at object recognition. And really interestingly, that's what they found with patient DF. She could not tell you what she was looking at. You could put a cup in front of her or a baseball bat. She couldn't tell you. That's visual agnosia, the inability to recognize objects. So patient DF could not tell people what she sees. But Milner and Goodale, smart scientists, they thought, well, let's see if we can get away with this verbal identification of objects. Let's see what uh, patient DF can do through her motor system because she can't tell you what an object is or what the orientation of a line is verbally. So what they did is they uh, created a set of slots. You can see a cartoon here. Um, and they could rotate the slots around. So imagine a little mailbox with a, a slot, if you will. And uh, between trials, you simply rotate the slot and you um, ask someone, patient DF, to um, say, okay, you know, here's a slot, replicate the orientation of that slot with a card, right? So that's what she's doing here. She's, don't use language, just tell me by orienting the card what the orientation of the slot is. Okay, what did she find? What did they find? Well, if you ask uh, typical people, uh, people with intact brains to do that task, it's, <laughs> tempted to say no brainer, um, it's very, very simple. They see a vertical slot, they hold the card vertically, easy. They're kind of wondering why you even asked me to do this study. Patient DF can't do the task, right? Same task, sometimes she'll say the orient, she'll show, put the card this way, sometimes she'll put the card this way. She cannot hold a card to communicate what the orientation of a slot is. Okay, and then they thought, well, Let's get rid of the communication altogether. Let's just have her work with the slot. So just take this, this card and put it in the slot as if you're mailing uh, a letter in a mailbox. Did the task again. This time, patient DF has no problem doing the task. So she has trouble holding the card in the right orientation to communicate what the orientation of the slot is but she has no trouble whatsoever just taking that card and <laughs> popping it in the slot. Hmm. So what Goodale and Milner concluded is that um, maybe that where pathway isn't a where pathway, but a how pathway. Maybe it's involved in how you're interacting with something. And so they uh, changed the names of the two pathways or freeways, if you will, to a perception pathway, which analyzes the world before we actually have to interact with it. Um, so maybe this is um, the pathway that's being used in experimental lab studies. And a second pathway called the action pathway, which is the one that goes up to the um, parietal cortex, that's involved in perception for the purpose of acting on the world, being in the world. So different models, you get a sense there of how uh, vision science evolves over new studies. And that's all I'm going to tell you about perception in the world. All right, students in my cognitive psychology class, head back to Canvas and get to work. Take care.